So I'm just wondering, what, what is it that we don't know about? What's the thing that you're excited about? What are you anticipating in the next 5, 10, 15 years? I guess the thing I worry about the most is the thing that WHO calls disease X, right? It is the emerging viral pathogen that we don't yet know about. We didn't know about MERS until all of a sudden camels from Saudi Arabia were giving MERS to people. We didn't really think much about Zika until all of a sudden Zika became a worldwide craze. So there is another pathogen on the horizon, and we just don't know what it is yet. First case of China's new and Officially hitting the This US. is an evolving situation. The worst is yet to come. The coronavirus emergency, we're seeing a rush to buy those face masks. New York City wants the epicenter of the virus. Cases are spiking. Hospital system says it's nearing 100% capacity. Mother and father killed by polio in this season's scourge. These are epidemics, children. A year of anxiety. We have seen many epidemics come and go, but this year's polio epidemic has been the greatest in America's history. It was so devastating that many of its victims were paralyzed in spirit as well as body. I love viruses, I love infectious diseases. I'm fascinated by these things. I'm a very visual person, I just love images. I want this to be the most creative place in the world to do vaccine research. I've worked with two of the most transmissible viruses on the planet. Viruses are beautiful. Viruses are biologically intriguing. Viruses are always surprise us. But you should never forget, it is something which is rather deadly. I knew I wanted to study deadly viruses, highly pathogenic viruses. I've always been fascinated in science and very early on in my undergrad career knew that viruses were super cool and I had to study them. The holy grail of infectious disease is understanding why you and I might get infected with the same thing, but one of us gets really sick and the other one doesn't. I've always been interested in biology and I like infectious diseases. Getting to study something so deeply, I thought was just fascinating. Infectious diseases is a big, huge problem in India and Africa, you know, because of the tropical weather condition. I love working in science. Even in my school days, I can't think of anything other than biology or medicine. Some of the viruses that we study in my lab are known as hemorrhagic fever viruses, and they get that name because when people get sick with them, they often have bleeding complications. I'm sure you've all heard of Ebola, which as you'll recall, caused a really big outbreak in West Africa in 2014. Ebola's been around since 1976, so we've known about that virus and people have studied that virus for decades. This coronavirus is a whole new world. It is a completely new virus. Coronavirus, a new virus which evolves, appears, adapts, changes, spreads, all those things. We have to equivalently adapt, evolve, change, diversify, fight. The ask on us as scientists and clinicians is to go from zero to a hundred at breakneck speed in order to beat this thing. At our holiday party, my desk becomes the CVR bar. Instead of hanging just Christmas baubles, we hung viruses from the tree. 
Yeah, we were cutting up snowflake shaped viruses and putting them on Christmas trees and sticking them all over that conference room. So we were having fun. Little did we know when we had our holiday party. No masks, no masks, no masks. None of this was known. COVID-19 didn't even have a name. And then bang, everything changes. In January of 2020, we started to see information about a respiratory virus coming out of China and about increasing cases. We just started talking in the scientific community. People are thinking, will it spread? Will it burn itself out? All of us at the CBR, we were following the number of cases and we knew this is going to get out of hand. I said to my family, now's the time to get ready. I said, you need to order some hand sanitizer and some wipes and you need to be prepared. Then the WHO announced it as a, like a pandemic. You could see that the infection is spreading worldwide and we, I knew that it's not going to go away. Paul, by then, he started saying, maybe we should do something about this. Then he runs across that hall all the way to Anita's office and he's like, yeah, I've decided we have to do something. And we're sitting at the table and he says to us, uh, it's time for us to mobilize. Like we are the Center for Vaccine Research. We have a wealth of knowledge and we need to participate in this response. What is our skill set? What do we bring? What can we do? How can we help? We know how to do vaccine development. We know how to grow viruses in culture. We know how to study immune responses to vaccination or to infection. All of those skill sets kind of came together and we said, okay, we'll trudge into this space. Paul, if you want to lead us there. We needed to begin to understand the biology of that pathogen. So a pathogen, what's a pathogen? A pathogen is something that makes you sick. It's a bacteria, it's a virus, it's a parasite. There are a range of viruses. Some are like really small, some are slightly bigger, and some are different shapes. Viruses are very, very simple. They only are made up of genetic information. This is surrounded by a protein coat to protect its nucleic acid or its genetic information. A virus's goal is to make more of itself. It's as simple as that. And the way it does that is it uses all the machinery that's present in the cells in your body to make more of itself. It can't do that on its own. A virus cannot replicate in the absence of being inside one of your cells. So this is where you and I come in. They have to infect the cells in our body in order to reproduce. How do we protect ourselves from pathogens? Vaccination is one of the major ways that we can protect ourselves. Let's talk about vaccination in general. V-A-C-C-A, -C -C vaca, that is Latin for cow. Why does it come from cow? That makes no sense, right? Late 1700s, early 1800s, there's a guy named Edward Jenner. He observes that women who milk cows, known as milkmaids, they get a disease on their hands that is known as cowpox. And those ladies, turns out, are protected from infection from smallpox. And he says to himself, hmm, what if I take the cowpox from the milkmaids and intentionally give it to people who've never had cowpox? And he does this, and essentially he demonstrates empirically that giving someone cowpox protects them from smallpox, and that is the birth of vaccination. I don't know how much he understood at the time, um, but basically what he was doing was using cowpox to generate an immune response from smallpox. What all vaccines are designed to do, from Jenner all the way until today, is to initiate the production of antibodies. When you get infected, your body makes antibodies that fight off infection. Antibodies are basically a weapon our body develops millions of antibodies go and attack the virus. Because remember, the antibodies are really, really small. Virus are big. So you need to have a lot of antibodies to go and tackle the virus. So a vaccine is often the weakened or inactivated version of the virus itself. This means it can trick the body's immune system into thinking it has been infected, but it doesn't cause the disease. This is a way to show the body a part of the pathogen so that when it sees the real deal, it's ready, right? It's ready to defend and to fight off the pathogen. Whenever you learn about vaccines, you learn about 
the work that Salk did many, many years ago. The virus that they were working on, of course, was polio virus. This was in 1949 when they started their work right here at the University of Pittsburgh. Back then, infectious disease was the number one cause of death in the world. Salk, he used a chemical inactivation procedure where he took the virus and he produced lots and lots of additional amounts of the virus. He took this and he mixed the virus with particular chemicals and then he inactivated the virus and then he used that to develop the salt vaccine. It was also a biological way to inactivate viruses. Albert Sabin developed a process where he took the genetic material of the polio virus and by passaging it in cells, that led to particular mutations in the genetic material. That process, known as attenuation, produced a polio virus but inside that polio virus, the genetic material had changed sufficiently that it didn't cause a disease, but it was a vaccine. That was the traditional minus 65 years ago approaches of developing vaccines. What we have now in vaccinology is a complete renaissance. When you think about a telephone in 1950 and a cell phone now, there is a chasm, an enormous gulf between those two. And that's a good way of thinking about what we can do with vaccines. They didn't have a lot of options. Maybe you could have a black telephone, maybe you could have a yellow one, but it still had a dial. Think of what we have now in cell phones. Apps, banking, texting, FaceTime, Salk. Save it. 65 years ago, they only could have dreamed about the plethora of ways in which we can creatively make new vaccines. We're now able to analyse the genetic code of viruses and use that information to create new kinds of vaccines. That has been a game changer. It allows us to develop vaccines so much faster. Question is, do they make antibodies? to trick the immune system into thinking that you've met SARS coronavirus before. So there are these multiple approaches, these many, many different ways, this creative canvas on which we can paint RNA vaccines, DNA vaccines, protein vaccines, all of these different ways to tackle this problem. In my mind, what was most important to do as a virologist was get that virus. We had to get it here. Valentine's Day 2020, the virus arrived in Pittsburgh in a box, not in a person. Many of the individuals in Pittsburgh justifiably asked the question, why are these people bringing this virus that we're hearing about on the news into Pittsburgh? The University of Pittsburgh's Center for Vaccine Research is on a very short the list. The Center for Vaccine Research is part of an international team. Police say their lab is one of a handful that can handle studying a virus like this. We all have photos of the virus coming in packages. Once we got the virus, the focus of the whole center changed. Everyone on this floor suddenly shifted to working with SARS coronavirus too. This is the box that we ship viruses in. In fact, this is the box that it came from the Center for Disease Control to Pittsburgh, one of the only five places in the early stages of the outbreak where we got the virus. You have to have special training for this. It has to have it come in a special container. And inside this container, uh, we have a biohazard bag to ensure that anyone who accidentally opens it, knows that they shouldn't be opening it. And then inside the biohazard bag, we have uh, a tissue. Just in case something happens that the virus would break, it would all then get mopped up by this tissue. This is the colored medium that the virus comes in. This would have been inside the bag. By that stage, you can see that it had a name. It was called SARS coronavirus 2. We have a biocontainment laboratory. 
perfectly suited, specifically designed, engineered for the purposes of working with emerging infectious diseases. You have to wear your PPE whenever you go to work with the coronavirus. The respirator that he's using, that is filling the mask with positive air. It's a new experience as a scientist and it's like a thrilling thing working with pandemic agent. It's actually a big threat for the public if it gets exposed. What he's going to do now is he's going to go and show us where the virus stays. In this minus 80 degrees freezer, he opens the door, he takes out this very cold rack this tiny, tiny tube that Sham will show us contains millions and millions of virus particles. We can now use this deadly virus to create a life-saving vaccine candidate to COVID-19. Our vaccine strategy is based on an existing vaccine for measles. This is an infectious disease I'd already been researching for years. Whenever I started working on it, one million children dying of measles each year. That's equivalent to seven Boeing 747s crashing every day of the year. The approach that Paul had taken in 2019 when we had just moved here, was to try and take measles vaccine and a bit of Rift Valley fever virus to see if we could make a vaccine against that. And we did, and it worked. So we were like, okay, well, let's take that and see if we could do the same thing for SARS coronavirus too. So the measles vaccine is a safe, weakened version of measles virus. And we know that measles vaccine is one of the most successful vaccine in the world. It's already something that's easy to manufacture. We give it to kids all the time. It's like a perfect no-brainer to just put SARS-CoV-2 proteins into a measles vaccine and test it out to see if it will work. The technology that allows us to move genetic material from one virus to another is called recombinant genetics. What do we mean by recombinant? Well, the word is recombine. We recombine the genetic material of measles with the genetic material of SARS coronavirus 2. So the virus looks like a ball and on the surface of that ball are spikes, right? That's what the protein is called. It's called the spike protein. And we know that our body always recognizes the spike protein as like the bad guy or the pathogen. My job was to take the measles vaccine and to figure out where to put this piece of SARS coronavirus 2. I always say uh, to my kids that it's basically cut and paste. You know, you cut it open and then you shove the spike protein into it and paste it with another enzyme. You know, it's like a glue. And now you have a new thing. That's called recombination. And the measles vaccine is still the measles vaccine, but it also displays the spike protein of SARS coronavirus 2. We should talk about this. Okay. I'll compile this data later today and, and put some figures together. One of the very early steps that is really important in proving that you can use a vaccine platform is to show that you can express foreign proteins. And people often do this with a protein that makes a color, right? Like a green fluorescent protein. What you do is you engineer this recombinant virus. And then we use antibodies which can identify the foreign protein. So we use that antibody and stain it. We try, we fail, we try again, we fail. We did have a lot of issues. We made four versions of this. Two weren't very good. Science is rather slow, rather repetitive. Sometimes like you think that like, oh, it might work. And then what happened is sometimes you don't hear anything after that. But one day, in one cell, in one particular moment in time, that whole symphony of molecular virology comes together. 
The green bits that you see are actually the SARS coronavirus 2 protein that's being made by this recombinant virus. We could see when we looked through the microscope the green glowing proof that the spike protein was present. It had worked. That recombinant measles virus producing the coronavirus spike, that candidate vaccine, which never ever existed before ever, is birthed in our labs. So once you have a potential vaccine candidate, then you need to evaluate it. You need to test it in animal models. You want to show that it has efficacy, right? That means, does it work? Does it protect against disease? We vaccinate and then we challenge with the virus that we've grown. So you can give a hamster your vaccine and then you can give it SARS-CoV-2 and you can ask, is that hamster protected from respiratory disease and is it protected from weight loss? And then you go to other laboratory animals. One animal model is usually not sufficient. People and mice are not the same. So most vaccines then get tested in non-human primate models. We are actively at the point where we are vaccinating non-human primates with measles SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and we're determining what their immune response is and whether or not they're protected from subsequent infection with SARS-CoV-2. And if those animals get sick, the vaccine hasn't worked very well, but if those animals are protected, the vaccine works. What Dr. Nambuli is going to show you inside the containment lab are plaque assays. Every little one of those white circles represents a virus. What we want to see are no white dots on the purple circles from the vaccinated animals and lots of white dots on the circles from the unvaccinated animals. I get to look at the results that Sham has in real time, he's just finished this experiment. Oh, oh, okay. You are actually seeing a real experiment? Um, what this tells us is that whenever Sham mixed the blood from the vaccinated animals with SARS coronavirus, those animals had antibodies which neutralized the virus. This is the proof we need to show that the vaccine works. Of course we've made it, you've seen the beautiful images of the spike protein in the cells. We've tested in mice. We know that those mice make wonderful antibodies. We have vaccinated animals and we have challenged those animals. And we're excited with the preliminary results. We need to isolate it. So okay. Now we begin the process of phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. Our clinical trials will be structured much like the polio trials for the Salk vaccine 65 years ago. Back then they used double-blind placebo trials where half the people got the vaccine and half didn't. That's the gold standard that we still use today because if they are successful it proves that the vaccine is safe and effective. The studies that my associates and I have been doing at the University of Pittsburgh have indicated clearly that it is possible to induce antibody formation in children uh, by suitable injections with a killed virus vaccine. Uh, more than that, uh, it appears uh, that uh, there are no harmful ill effects accompanying these inoculations. That didn't hurt, did it? Okay. <laughs> it's not a vaccine until it's a product. It's not a vaccine until a physician or a nurse can go to a fridge, open the door, take out the vial, get a needle, and take the arm of a kid or an adult and vaccinate them. 
that's a vaccine. Each of the COVID vaccines are having to overcome the challenges of manufacturing and distribution on a speed and scale that we have never attempted before. Some of them will require more than one dose. Others will be transported in deep freeze conditions. People often talk about the race for this vaccine. I see it not as a race because first may not be best. There's not gonna be a one size fits all approach to this vaccine. There are gonna be multiple vaccine options for people in different parts of the world, for people with different medical conditions, for young, for old. It might not be as fast as we initially intended. It will be done well, rigorously, safely. But vaccines are only going to work if enough people take them. I can completely understand why people worry, why people are hesitant, but by doing good science that allows us to build trust, to work with communities, then we can champion vaccines because we are all part of one community. Most importantly, these are not vaccines for just one part of the world, but these are vaccines for everyone. Everybody in Salk's time knew someone who had polio. They saw it in their communities. They understood the risks of it. People really were afraid to send their kids out in the summer because of polio virus. So they said to themselves, I want this protection for myself and for my families. These were children that were suffering. So there was a real motivation in the community to get the vaccine. I like to think that our current culture and society will be equally as motivated to get a COVID vaccine. Once it has been demonstrated to be efficacious and safe in a phase three clinical trial and approved by the FDA, that is the time at which I think Americans should be lining up in droves to get this vaccine because every single one of them want their life to go back to normal. This is an incredible challenge. It's a moment in history which is truly unprecedented for my generation interested in vaccine development. It's tiring and it's frustrating, but I wouldn't have it any other way. That's what motivates us, that we can make a difference. Science demands us to think creatively, come up with new ideas, to come up with new approaches, our practical creativity creates vaccines, and vaccines are beautiful in themselves because something which creates an intervention, which stops a disease, it's certainly beautiful in terms of how humanity lives another day because of the creative process of vaccine development. Many months ago, my husband decided to buy a t-shirt for me. It says science is our superpower. Quite honestly, um, science is, it is our superpower, right? It is the superpower of the, the folks at the Center for Vaccine Research. It is the superpower of scientists and clinicians and public health experts and epidemiologists all over the world. And it is science that will save us. There will be another pathogen that comes in the future. And if we have all of the infrastructure and the platforms in place to rapidly mobilize and generate a vaccine, maybe we can see a scenario in the future where we're not shut down for an entire year. Will COVID be here for a while? Yes. But will that burden of disease be treated by one of the most revolutionary biomedical interventions that we have ever come up with as a society. Vaccines. Yes. <laughs>